Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're watching and listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Today, our very special guest is Randy Moggins of Off Planet Radio and TV. Randy Moggins is a longtime radio talk show host, producer, and writer working in the fields of religion, politics, and the paranormal. With an early start in radio as a high school intern at a local public radio station, he has worked as both a rock radio and a club DJ, produced and hosted talk radio in his native central Pennsylvania, and appeared on shortwave radio as the host of several shows on religion and politics, as well as hosting and producing the Exotica Paranormal Series for shortwave satellite and internet radio since 2005. So in short, folks, Randy is one of the pioneers in this field. Randy's background includes work in the music field as a performer and writer, a background in audio engineering and production, extensive work in the field of internet media production. His long-running Threshing Floor show has had a continuous web presence since 2003, before the era of what is now called podcasting on the web. His technology background includes work as software training consultant, programmer, web designer, and work in corporate technology sales and consulting. An interest in the esoteric, paranormal, and occult stems from early life experiences, which fueled his quest to understand the complex issues of the phenomena of UFOs and ETs, as well as exploring the black operations, mind control programs, and esoteric arts behind a global conspiracy of soul harvesting. His training in Christian ministry has transitioned into a spiritual approach to the supernatural, paranormal, and covert operations. And in 2009, he created Off Planet Radio to expand the scope of his research and presentation. While maintaining a journalistic approach that allows for a wide range of views to be explored in an objective manner, Off Planet Radio does have an agenda to expose the works of darkness and deception and provide a presence for exploring authentic spirituality and healing. In 2016, Off Planet Radio welcomed Emily Moyer as producer and co-host to the show lineup, creating a dynamic of interaction and balancing energies. Randy currently lives in southern central Pennsylvania with his wife, Debbie. He enjoys mountain hiking, skiing, music, and photography, and travels as often as possible. The website is offplanetradio.com. And a um, special treat for our members in part two, uh, Randy will be discussing some of his personal experiences as well as the insights and understanding he's gleaned from these experiences. So uh, you members are in for a special treat. Our website is at the Cosmic Switchboard uh, dot com. So without any further ado, Randy Moggins, welcome to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. James, thanks for having me on. It's a real privilege to be here with you. Uh, the, the pleasure is all ours, Randy. There's so much going on in the world today. Just shoot from the hip. What do you feel at this time, you know, the listeners should be kind of like paying attention to certain trends? Where do you see certain things going? The big encompassing theme right now has a lot to do with the areas of artificial intelligence, AI, and the um, what I will call pending reset of the global economy. This uh, funnels as well into the issues of cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, and it also goes into aspects of them building another level of the matrix having to do with binary computer codes and an attempt to continue to soul trap humans into the matrix. Yes, please elaborate. Uh, just touch on any one of those subjects. Well, you know, it goes into, you know, how we understand our own existence. And this goes back into my own background of studying what I loosely call religion. But when I talk about religion, I'm talking about the sort of organic approach to our relationship to a creator and our own existential beingness in a physical dimension. And I never thought it was really remarkable that when I was a kid, I was challenging this stuff, questioning this stuff. It was a lifetime abiding interest um, until I began to wake up. And when I say that, that wasn't an event, it was a process that took me and still is unfolding, but I would say a period of about 25 years to where I came to understand kind of my own inert grasp and understanding who we are, what we are, why we're here, those existential questions we all ponder in the back of our heads if we have a semblance of 
soul to ourselves. But then understanding that there was something very dark about all this. There was something that lurked in the background of the reality stream that when you were able to step outside of it, you realized that there were two worlds. One was the soul-breathed organic world where we existed and this matrix construct that we were thrust into, into a physical dimension of space and time. So for me, it's been about unraveling all that. That's been a lifetime journey. It probably will be a lifetime journey. And the interesting thing is that <clears throat> I've gone back and I've looked at the writings I've done since I was probably about 13 or 14 years old, which includes journals, um, poetry, song lyrics, uh, artwork, and realized that this was really the only thing I ever cared about, that everything else was kind of, was kind of uh, sitting there on the side while I pursued this. It's, it's my passion to understand this. It's my passion for other people to discourse about it because just as we're doing right now, my goal and what I originally set out to do by the time I got to Off Planet Radio was I wanted to unbox this thing. I wanted to put it out there I wanted a dynamic, fluid conversation about it, and I wanted to talk to other people like me. And that was, that was really the goal, that's really what's propelled this whole thing. And the human consciousness wave has been sparking up in our lifetime. I mean, we're both of a generation, and we've lived through some of the most incredible changes that humanity has experienced in thousands of years in our lifetime. It's been, because we're in it, I don't think we really appreciate the accelerated pace we've come since, just to give a benchmark, we'll say the 1960s, which most people agree was a cultural watershed. But really it started much earlier than that. It started early in the 20th century. And by the end of the Second World War, uh, a lot of both the advanced consciousness and the weapons that were being unleashed against this happening were already coming to fruition, which is how we got to the post-World War II era and what became the, 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 dark, the black projects, uh, the mind control programs, the social engineering that really stepped up as we went into the post-World War II era. The 1950s and 1960s were a huge period of social engineering that most people don't appreciate because they were living through it. So all of that kind of, well, that kind of takes us to a place where we need to step back once in a while and examine, the, you know, this, this, this arc of history that we're living in and understand we are at the precipice right now of huge changes in human consciousness and any advancement of our own relationship to creation and our world and whether we like it or not we're here we have to deal with this you know people have said to me well you say it's a matrix you say it's an illusion and that's true in a comparative sense but i've always said no this is important this counts what we're doing right now in this life in this world counts heavily you can't just dream your life away and wish things were better or live in la la land you got to do something about it so that's kind of the uh that's kind of the brief that I work by. Yes, and it, I'm glad you brought up the, the 40s and 50s because now with the benefit of hindsight, we can question some of the assumptions we made. And, and we, can, uh, we can see how after World War II, there was a sense of relief, maybe even a sense of malaise had set in with a lot of people. Okay, well, you know, they rid the world of all this evil and now we can settle in and we can live the good life. But... Meanwhile, this military industrial psychological complex, Randy, you talked about that, and that was so key. We look at Edward Bernays, we look at the constant hammering we get from uh, from propaganda and, and from the media today. It's questionable just how many original people, original thoughts people have today. And that's actually an interesting point: original thoughts, and that goes. That goes deep into a lot of the aspects that have to do with us being able to examine where we are. Um, one of the things that I learned years ago in my reading and research was um, 
the work of uh, uh, several Russian writers. Uh, one of them was P.D. Auspensky. Auspensky lived at the beginning of the 20th century, and he was really a forerunner of human consciousness. But what he was saying at that time is, your thoughts are not your own. Most of what is going through your head at any given time is this kind of disassociated talk that goes on in the back of your head. It's a narrative that has been installed in you. You think those are your thoughts. But those thoughts are installed. It's the installed narrative that goes through your head. And so Alspensky was one person that understood that. I think Jung kind of started to get it towards the end of his life to some degree. For the most part, psychology hasn't really embraced this. We tend to think of people who have other thoughts in their heads as being um, schizophrenic. But in fact, all of humanity is split consciousness and schizophrenic at a, at a very deep level because we don't have the authentic intuitive voice active anymore because that gets the programming, the social engineering that we have from the time we're small children. We come into this world Popular psychology says that babies are born tabula rasa. I totally disagree with that. We what, is it, born, what does that term mean, Randy? It means blank slate. Yes, I disagree um, with that too. Yeah, no, but that, that's the dominant narrative in psychology is that children are born as blank slates, that a baby is basically formed. That's the whole nature versus nurture psychology proposition that's given to you that's still trotted out all over the place but in fact you're born with a soul with a personality you have a really highly developed you just watch little kids i mean it's it's a journey to watch a little kid an infant and and how different they are and what what they are innately inside of them it's very clear this is a fully formed being it simply doesn't have the facility yet to express in physicality it's still basically out there swimming in kind of the astral world, so to speak. And so we, you know, we're programmed and those patterns are laid early and some of them are necessary. I mean, we have to be taught to recognize the dangers of the physical world. We have to be taught we need to do the appropriate things as human beings. You, you know, obviously children need to be trained in certain areas, but at the same time, we're installing programs into them, both as parents and as a culture that creates and begins to form the narrative that forms in the child's brain, usually between the ages of three and four, is what I've found, is that we start to develop that. That's actually when you become consciously aware and begin to formulate memories for the most part, which I find interesting because most people that I've talked to who have ET, paranormal, um, and black ops, things going on in their lives, the earliest memories tend to form around the three to four year age mark, because that's generally the point at which you have developed that, that, that consciousness that's able to concretize the world that you live in. Yes, uh, I've had some key formative experiences around that time frame too, when I was three and four years old. What I found, Randy, is due to this long-term social engineering, and we're now talking multiple generations of, of people at families who've been subjected to this social engineering mind control. And then you layer upon that, you know, like the health standpoint where we've had multiple generations now of, of fast food eaters where they have no gut floor worth speaking of that's any good. And so yep. what, what's interesting is they have created this group of people that are, have become very docile, submissive, and always defers to the authority of others. And how do we as people that are trying to plant seeds, trying to encourage and uplift and wake up others, you know, without a sense of elitism, Randy, how do we interact with these people and, and, and not let them frustrate us? You know what I mean? Yeah, that's interesting. I was just having that conversation with my, my wife at breakfast this morning. You know, and she's gone. It's funny. You look at people and you realize that the enforcement of all of this, the entrainment, is largely dominated by fear. Most people are afraid to stand up to authority, even, even passively. 
stand up to authority. Even just a little voice in your head that goes, no, I'm not going there. And that's enforcement at a high level because you're constrained already. Your natural, our natural expression is to be free. That's, that's first and foremost what we are supposed to be. But we aren't really free and we really aren't allowed to be free and we're given a substitute that's called freedom and that freedom has all these rules in, attached to it and you come to find out that the people that are touting your freedom are the same people that are tramping, trampling on the freedoms of others in order to institute the so-called freedom that, like for here in the United States. I mean, this is a war nation. It's a war economy. Has been our entire lives. There's not much that you touch in this culture that's not attached to the military, industrial, intelligence, psychological complex, just like you talked about earlier. Almost everything is ancillary to that in some way. So we're not free in the sense of expression of freedom, and we're not free inside of our own minds, which is the bigger problem. Because what constrains us are those voices that were installed as sort of software programs when we were too small to be able to really counter them with any, any meaningfulness. So you get to the point where people like us are, and because of extreme things that have gone on in our lives in some sense, waking up from that is actually like the gigantic immune shot that you got when you were young that you suddenly realized that you don't have to take this anymore. So, you know, what I find interesting about the community around people that I call the TIMK community, people who are targeted, people who have been part of projects, people who have been part of my labs and things like that, is that they're, they're very damaged people. But at the same time, they're the people who the resistance actually was put into because of having to battle long enough to survive. You know, the TI community that exists on the internet, the, the real ones, not the frauds, those are the people that survived. There are tens of thousands, quite possibly hundreds of thousands of people that did not survive those programs, that are not here. And so those are benchmarks of people who already have won the first round of a very extreme battle existentially. Yes, and what I've always uh, regarded when you mention project people, TIs, MKs, and, and my labs, is I see them at the spear point, and they, they couldn't help but be at this spear point. Because I hear a lot of people, and I don't say this you know, with a sense of elitism or you know, intolerance, but when you hear people that are just coming to grips with the surface level of this control system, you know, they're rightfully upset about you know, the burgeoning police state and everything else, you know, a lot of us, my labs, and a lot of us, we've already gone through that. We've already gone through the harassment, the the surveillance, the the dream hacking, et cetera, et cetera. So the irony is the people that one can learn the most from as far as what this Orwellian kind of uh, control system is all about are precisely the ones that modern psychology, which itself is a sham and part of the control system, has shunted off to the fringes, right? Yeah, we're kind of Orwell's children. Yeah. We're very much a product of the mindset that came really in the late 19th century, early 20th century, because all of this was in formation back then. Um, kind of goes back to the Galtons and the Darwins and all the people who formed the early Milner Roundtable in the early 20th century you know, what eventually becomes Tavistock and migrates into the U.S. after World War II as the Fourth Reich or Project Paperclip, um, that was, those projects fanned out into an entire generation. I don't know that people realize that not just the people who were in those projects, but the entire generations around them were part of the programming. The Woodstock generation was a generation that was experimented on from birth. They were the first generation that was fully vaccinated, yes. that had access to so-called modern medical science, the, the miracle of modern medicine. Let me sing your praise, praises. But that was all 
That was all selective social engineering for them to be able to track a generation that was being programmed on the fly, mainly through our culture. You and I, before we started this conversation today, we were talking about rock music and about you know different bands that we both like and the, the programming behind them and uh, an understanding that that music was used to program us. Yes. The music we love. I mean, we were talking about Deep Purple's Child in Time song off of uh, In Rock and how that's such a benchmark for us emotionally. And, and that song came out of the cauldron of the 60s. I mean, I always interpreted the song on some level as being about Kent State, Jackson State, the riots that occurred in the United States, and the show of military force that was arrayed against um, the early protesters of the Vietnam War which was another manufactured social experiment as well. Let's take a generation and toss them into a war in a third world country where we've never declared and we've never stated a target and which was fomented on a false flag operation, yes. by the way. Uh, and then it's amazing because, well, the commander of that boat at the Gulf of Tonkin just happens to be the father of, oh, Jim Morrison. <laughs> rock singer for the doors one of yeah. the well, yeah, so you see all of those programs were operating inside and outside the culture at a real high level and we were we were just basically going along for the ride and it's the same with every generation every decade after that i mean you look into rock music you look into punk rock you look into club music emily and i talk about this a lot because emily talks a lot about what goes on in modern dance music and the programming that's in, in that as well. It's all been one social experiment that we now have to extricate ourselves from first on our consciousness and then we have to somehow liberate our bodies from this. That's key because talking about the music aspect or what passes for it today, I, I think the, there's one genre called emo or something, basically just bouncy mm -hmm. electronic music. And mm -hmm. the times I found myself at a disco or, 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 or a dance club, I'd be out there dancing and boogieing. 19 minutes later, the track hasn't ended. I'm still out there, you know what I mean, dancing, because, you know, it, it's a form of entrainment. And a lot of the so-called hip-hop music, especially these days, completely at variance with, you know, if one – track the the origins of that music a lot of it originated from people in south central who, la who were just tired of all the police brutality and etc etc yeah. and then that morphed into this gangster rap due to the control of, of, of the the music industry and so what we have is we have this form of entrainment all across the board and i talked about this too randy look at america i don't, I don't know what it's like in other states but in in arizona and in california all the different genres of music, most of them are owned by Murphy Broadcasting or Clearwater Communications. So they do this thing where they play the same six or seven songs over yeah. and over and over throughout the day, and that can't help but create this OCD thought loop uh, of, you know, just manipulation in, in one's head. And what I yeah. see going on is this gradual separation of, of mind and body, where people are no longer embodied. They can't stand to have a quiet yeah. moment. They have to fill their surroundings with a cacophony of noise, et cetera. It's because they're just in their headspace, which makes it so easy for them to be manipulated. Yeah, so well, that's probably the – it's either going to be club music or it's going to be television or it's going to be recreational drugs or sex or something that obsesses you, that keeps you constantly – an OCD thought loop, that's a fantastic way of – of putting it. I love that. I've heard you say that in some of your other shows. It really does entrain us into a constant desiring of something that stimulates us when, in fact, both individually and as a culture, what we really need is we need, and this is, you know, the, the I guess the, the closing line on every off planet radio show I've ever done probably has been. The truth is out there, which is X-Files. And then dot, 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 it's inside you, which is actually a paraphrase of what Jesus said in the Bible, that the kingdom of heaven is within you. Because it's out there, but it's inside you. 
in order to facilitate healing on any level, and we all need it, whether you think you've been in a project or not, we all need healing, is to find the place within, the quiet. That means you have to shut all that off. That means that you have to go deeply inside yourself, withstand being able to come to face with yourself. And almost nobody in this culture is willing to do that anymore. I mean, religion now, I was in the churches in the 90s through 2002. Um, I went so far as to go through course for divination and was um, basically ordained by a church to act as a minister. What was interesting in that time was I grew up in, in was sort of high church, um, Methodist and Episcopal, where there was times of meditation in those churches, where quiet music and people would get very still and very quiet. The churches now are rock concerts. Yes. They have full-on rock bands on stage. They call them praise teams, worship teams. And the whole thing is a performance from the time they hit the stage. I know I played in one of those bands. Even in, uh, up until about 2000, I was playing in a, in a worship team as a, uh, as a worship minister. And I, it's, it's a lot of fun when you're doing it. It's very spirited. It's very uh, invigorating. But what it never had was the sense of introspection and the sense of calmness and clarity that you get from what you would actually call real prayer or real meditation. So even there, they, they've, they've destroyed the spiritual underpinnings of the culture through religion. What we're also seeing is this constant uh, onslaught of change to disorient and destabilize us. You, you've touched in the past on the the AI agenda, as, as, and I'd like you to comment on that as well, but also the, the transgender agenda also, which yeah. is another layer of confusion. It's another layer of disembodiment, if you will, paradoxically, while we're being told that we're entirely different gender from what we're born. A little story here. I used to live in San Diego, and the financial district of San Diego was La Jolla, for people that are familiar mm -hmm. with the place. Yeah. A stone's throw from that huge emerald city, Mormon. I know La Jolla, yeah. <laughs> right on Highway 5. And there's right. stories I could tell you about that of UFOs hovering down, beaming blue lights uh, down on the temple <laughs> in the middle of the night. But, yep. uh, but in, in the financial district there is a lot of the, uh, the spooky – corporations, SAIC, Science Applications International Corporation, among others. And they, at the time, they had a big reflecting pool there, right? So I mm -hmm. went down there one time with my Polaroid, and there was, this is like in the early 90s, Randy, and there was two huge larger-than-life statues in front of this reflecting pool. And the one on the left, the plaque read, The Old Man, and it showed a, a guy in biblical garb, a biblical era garb, a shepherd's guy kind of outfit and the staff, right? And then next to it, to the right, the plaque read the new man. And what it showed was this an androgynous, bald-headed, she mm -hmm. she kind of wearing a gown, you, indeterminate gender, right? And so that stuck me. It didn't it didn't register till much later what they were getting at. The old man in the biblical outfit, right? Shepherd's garb, the new man, quote unquote but it was an androgynous, bald-headed individual. And look where we're at now. <clears throat> yeah, well, the transgender agenda is <clears throat> right in line with the AI agenda. The two are the same. I'm not averse to uh, whatever people's preferences are in terms of sexuality. Uh, me too, I agree. I, I, and I've been through that culture I was in New York in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, I was around discos. I was around the punk rock clubs, um, gay bars, gay discos. Uh, that culture is both fascinating as a pastiche of um, human variety, as well as an indicator that we're not all wired the same in some ways. Having said that, and <clears throat> having looked at this even from the perspective of my own life, I recognize that this transgender, this new non-binary, um, non-identificational gender that we're going through now is 
something much darker because it's, it's, it's stripped away every identifiable piece of landscape that we have in terms of understanding a human being on the level of who, what they are biologically. They're blurring it. They're doing this deliberately. And it's creating uh, a, a, what it, it's a full, full-blown psychological syndrome, syndrome called um, gender dysphoria, which basically has a class of people who they, they don't know what they are. They don't know who they are. And in the end, they just go, I don't know. I don't care. Call me they. Call me it. Call me. We're that far. This is, this is, this is a program that's very old. It's, it's kind of the high Masonic order um, hermaphroditic ideal that's expressed in numerous ways through very ancient cultures as well. But now they found the technology to facilitate this in such a way that all of this is blurred. And it creates a cultural dysphoria along the way because we're now having to grapple with a culture where you can't identify people according to gender or in any other way that we recognize. But it's also creating a psychological backlash as well. Um, you cannot survive on the edge of your identity. Sooner or later, you have to know who you are. People who have gone through any kind of psychological trauma in their life know they have to reestablish themselves first. My experience with people who are going through any kind of gender identity is that they're not grounded in themselves. And that's what this is doing. This is, this, is, this is basically destabilizing the entire culture. Again, it's more social engineering. It's just another level of social engineering at, at a very fundamental level. Yes, because we, we originally saw ourselves as a distinct species. We're humans, and, you know, granted, we have different expressions of the human race. We have different races, different colors, different cultures, what have you. But usually there was a clear delineation between male and female. But because of what's happened, Randy, where now with the safe schools agenda, et cetera, et cetera, combined with the lobotomizing effect of the media, Common Core, which just teaches people – to the common core does just to be obedient uh, no matter how ridiculous the lesson no matter how ridiculous the order or the command is we're just supposed to be automatons but yeah. in the overall scheme of things from their standpoint we're supposed to be like asexual automatons we're supposed to be androgynous automatons and what they're already bringing into the grade schools and elementary schools is gender identity uh, issues and and gender equality and 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 sexuality uh, you know to a very large degree and it's being reinforced by the media it's being reinforced by by politicians so from an archontic ai standpoint we're starting to head into that very dark place that you know the ancients had talked about yeah very much so and you know at the same time the burgeoning psychological industry is there very happy to give us whatever drugs we need to go through this, which opens up more rifts in the psyche. Yes, it does. Probably one of the biggest areas. Um, I had no idea the power of this. Um, I've experienced several meltdowns in my life. I've gone through therapy, both as a teenager and later on as an adult, which was a much better experience, um, as well as continuously working on my own mental health and um through a, a, an incident back in uh, the 1990s i wound up becoming addicted to xanax horrible i had no idea this drug was addictive i had to go through rehab to get off of it it was prescribed to me and not only that but they wanted to put me on more medications more drugs but what i discovered going through the whole thing with xanax and researching uh, pharmacological aspects of, of these these drugs, some of which the SSRIs, the um, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, um, which were prescribed to me, but which thankfully at that point I was waking up enough to look at this and go, no, I don't think so. Um, those are tearing holes in people's psyche. 
And that's the danger of all of this. Even the gender identity thing, I don't think people understand this opens up a whole realm of uh, harvesting, energy harvesting, loose harvesting, uh, entity inhabitation into the fields that um, basically drains you as a human being. And so you're left fighting a battle as an empty shell because your soul's been completely drained and devoid of any individual consciousness. Yes, the SSRIs not only destroy cognitive function, but they can induce psychotic episodes. I mean, I don't know why I'm laughing. I mean, it, suicidal ideations, violent tendencies, and this is supposed to be a form of treatment. It just shows, Randy, how bass backwards everything is. And I'm glad you brought that up because at some point, those people that are only aware of the surface level manipulation, the fiat currency, the, you know, the false flags, et cetera, they're going to have to recognize that there's, there's a darker non-human element at work, whether it's hyperdimensional, whether it's, whether it's extraterrestrial, whether it's a combination, whatever, working through these, these hybridized bloodlines, which are genetically, indeed spiritually, predisposed to being taken up by these entities to affect the changes these entities want here on our surface world. And it, it's, it's almost as if, well, it is, that they've created the Sodom and Gomorrah kind of uh, culture and put it right in our face and normalized everything. Yeah, that's interesting. It is very much that. Um, the ultimate end of a culture is a termination point because when we don't differentiate ourselves anymore, we're not going into higher consciousness. We're going into a hive mind, which is the architecture of many of the ETs. Um, yes. The, 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 whether it's Draco or Mantids or the Arachnids or whoever, those are hive mind entities. They are trying to get us to the place where we're hive mind entities at all because we're, we're more controllable on mass as a hive mind. So, you know, this isn't just about people with gender dysphoria or uh, issues related to psychopharmacology. It has a bigger issue in terms of the culture beginning to be entrained into a system to create a hive mind reflex type culture, which is what you see when you see these riots, you see flash mobs, um, you see the type of reactions that you have in the political sphere. This, you know, the, 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 the hysteria over Donald Trump in the United States yes. is unbelievable. And it's both sides. I'm not picking on anybody here. I don't vote. I'm not really part of that system. I don't have a dog in the hunt. I have preferences in terms of who I think may be better. And I'll leave that for another conversation. But having said that, we are in a state of hysteria here in the United States over Donald Trump. The reactions are just they're profound and they are tearing our culture apart and it's hive mind you have the hive on the left and the hive on the right and they're re they're they're reacting to each other as much as they're reacting to trump to the point where you can't have civil conversations about politics with people anymore i just refuse to do it i try to stay away from it in my posts on facebook as much as possible because there's you can't win there's no winning proposition now. The, the culture itself has been polarized. The polarization is the dialectic narrative that they're installing so that later on they can install the hive mind narrative and get us all entrained into one constant sine wave of reaction. And what they did also, Randy, with, you know, bringing us to the state or bringing a lot of people to the state of the hive mind and thank you for bringing up the, the implications for soul harvesting because, you know, we have to look beyond what's happening in, in, in the earthly plane because there definitely is yeah. a soul harvesting recycling element to it. And if people load themselves up with these pharmaceuticals and this bad, you know, imitation food, that's where they're going to be headed. And they're just now rolling out the, five, the whole 5G thing too on top of that. Yeah. So what I see them doing is they – a necessary prerequisite to all that was stripping us of the survival instinct. You know, like mm -hmm. even in the wild, you know, parents or the mother of, of, of a newborn protects it from, you know, a multiple threat environment. 
it teaches it how to survive. It's instinctual. But now it's, you know, parents are offering up their children, you know, almost as sacrifices to this weird, you know, allopathic medical system. They've lost the ability to to critically think and, and they've lost or never had the survival instinct. So then progressing on from that, it's this like dystopia that, that you talked about. And so when we get to the point now where everything is of a high emotional content, you look at all these social justice warriors, you look at Antifa, yeah. everything is so polarized. Everything, e even the issues of health, it, where if people decide to go to, you know, like a, a naturopath or something, that it just evokes strong emotions, which are all based on the fear element that was all inculcated to us. And now, thanks for bringing up the whole Trump thing. And, and I think it was very clever. I give credit where credit's due. Uh, they give us a choice of Trump or Hillary and like, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like, like I would have voted if, if I was into that game, I would have voted for Godzilla on permanent steroid rage than, than Hillary, you know? Um, right. So then they vote for Trump and all the baggage he's got. He's the Twitter president, just riling people up left and right. So they needed him at this stage, Randy, to create civil unrest and, divide and conquer domestically, but still to push for greater, greater expansions of wars. And you talked about Bitcoin earlier, which is very topical. Thank you for bringing that up. I see like the BRICS, for example, as a fallback, right? And I could be wrong about this, but, you know, some of these countries, whether it's right or wrong, from their perspective, they're saying, okay, sooner or later, this petrodollar uh, reserve currency system is going to go belly up at least we're going to have something to fall back on. Yes, the, the Rothschild Zionists have their fingers in all of that brick stuff, but I can see from their standpoint that we still want something to fall back on, right? And a lot of these countries have started to move away from the petrodollar. They're, they're, they're starting to have other reserve currencies. How does Bitcoin and the whole cryptocurrency uh, uh, aspect fit into all this? I'm still learning that. Um, Me too. We've done... You know, we've done a number of shows with Cliff High on this, and we batted it back and forth. I've been looking at Bitcoin since 2012, and I've never been comfortable with it. Um, I like the concept of it on one level, but the most terrifying aspect of it to me was when I began to look at what a blockchain was and how it worked, and what was required to first build a blockchain, and then sustain a blockchain. In a nutshell, Randy, uh, what is a blockchain? The blockchain is the data that goes out on the web that basically contains what's called the secure ledger for the Bitcoin accounts. It's a transparent ledgering system that's basically, anyone can go look at it. You can go to I think, is it bitcoin.io or something like that, bitcoin.org. You can find the link. You can look at the ledger. I mean, it's really just a string of transactions that are ongoing constantly within the blockchain itself, which is being built even as this thing is functioning. But behind all of this, there's a huge output of energy that's required to do this. Um, at one point in time, I considered Bitcoin mining just because I'm a geek and I like doing interesting thing with computers, but uh, it's, it's outstripped people like me now. I mean, basically the way Bitcoin is mined now is guys are putting together gigantic rigs, uh, sometimes the size of your, 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 your dining room table with these huge bays of uh, very advanced graphics cards uh, like NVIDIA or AMD advanced graphics cards, most of them running maybe 10 gigabytes of memory a piece, gang together and basically churning bits like, like crazy, uh, producing all kinds of heat, consuming all types of, all manner of electricity. I mean, mining a coin, you can, you can light half a city block with the power that it requires to do these Bitcoin transactions. So they're building something else on top of it. A simple transaction system would not require the output energy that is being put into this project. And while it started out as grassroots, it's not grassroots now. It is definitely in the hands of some very large corporations and um, we'll say criminal syndicates and hacker groups deeply entrenched within the system. 
And it's my opinion that what they are building is basically a binary system in which to create a parallel world financially for us that will require us investing into it. Uh, the simple answer would be, if you read the book of Revelation and it talks about the mark, and the mark of the beast where it says that no, no man may buy nor sell unless he has the, the mark and the number of the beast, that would largely be it if you look at it from a biblical standpoint. Um, it's actually that dangerous in my opinion. What we're seeing is, is tremendous volatility. And, you know, I really don't know much about it. I'm, I'm wanting to learn more about it because it's so topical. But I was under the impression that there was only going to be a finite number of, of Bitcoins. And I guess they divide these Bitcoins up, you know, endlessly. So, well, not really endlessly, but to allow people to get in at a lower level. But they, yeah. it, it's supposedly designed to prevent inflation where they just start creating more and more of them. Is, is that the case? Yeah, well, it's a fixed number. I, I don't know if it was 2 billion or what. I, I can't remember the exact number. We'll use that number it, fixed. At some point, there's X number of Bitcoins. There will be no more. The denomination comes then in denominating fractionally down, even in bits. I mean, tiny minuscule bits of a Bitcoin. Ah, um, hence the term Bitcoin. It's the coin star. Bit, well, no pun intended. Exactly. No, it's exactly what it is. It's just like the bits in a computer. Most people don't deal with bits in a computer because those are binary units numerically used in computational cycles. So most people don't have a concept of that. They think, if you think of anything at all, you'd think about, well, you know, I have a, I have a, a, a little flash drive here and this is a 16 gigabyte flash drive. And you think, well, that's the capacity of that. At one time you had these things called floppy disks, you know, hard disks in our computers. You know, we understand the numbers relative to the capacity of something, but we don't really understand how that functions as you go further and further down the food chain. Coders understand this because they deal with binary numbers on, on a very high level. Some of them are coding down almost to machine code level. So in, in understanding how Bitcoin operates, and I'm not an expert in it, and I'm, I'm being schooled by some very good people, but it isn't computer illiteracy so much as conceptual. What's the concept? And if you go back and you read the Satoshi white papers that were published, I want to say 2009, 2010, they never specified something as Bitcoin is now functioning because Bitcoin is now functioning as an investment vehicle where people think they're making money. It was designed to be a payment transaction system, digital, mm. anonymous, and transparent ledgering. That was the concept behind it. So it doesn't really function now the way it was originally mapped. And the way it was originally designed, we don't know who Satoshi is. Yes, he's like a we Robin Masters type. We don't know if this guy even exists or not, you know? Right. So there's a lot of illusion in this. And there's a lot of questions that can't seem to be answered. I mean, uh, if you talk to somebody who's like Cliff High, uh, a computer programmer, he looks at things like a computer programmer, so he understands it from a computer programmer level. I want to understand what it is in terms of substance or lack of substance. And nobody's been able to answer that. Uh, Bitcoin is at, what is it today, $13,000? I mean, it's doubling and tripling in shorter and shorter cycles. It's now logarithmic. It's not linear anymore. That may represent the fact that gross, the gross fiscal output is now being transitioned into Bitcoin. It's literally perhaps sucking money out of the current so-called fiat system into that system. So what is really happening right now is we are transitioning value into the Bitcoin system or into the cryptocurrency markets at an accelerating pace because the, the cost of bit, the price of Bitcoin right now doesn't represent an increase in value of Bitcoin. It represents the decline of the US dollar. 
I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, I'm not yeah, sure well, it's possible. It, it's, it makes sense to me, you know, and, and again, I'm all learning about, about this. And, you know, what's kind of interesting to me also is I think there was a recent announcement how they're going to start trading in futures for, for Bitcoin. And, yeah. and like, doesn't that like defeat the whole process of the original <laughs> concept of using it as a simple trade and barter system? Yeah, it's also, it's adopting all of the models of the current financial system, all of them. Everything that you can think of right now, uh, going into commodities markets, um, all of it, the whole thing is taking on uh, all the appearances of simply another drop-in financial system. And my question and my suspicion is that an economic reset would be a reset into a cryptocurrency system, whether it's Bitcoin or some aggregated Bitcoin type system. Because we can't continue down the line with the U.S. dollar, and the U.S. dollar ha is what's benchmarked all the other currencies. So my challenge to the Bitcoin community is evaluate your currency on something other than current existing fiat currencies. Give us a base level value for this thing. Fix it, just like you fixed the quantity of Bitcoin. And then we have the beginning of stable currency, but we don't have that. We have wild speculation right now. And people are getting burned on it. I mean, there's been hundreds of millions of dollars lost in these exchanges. Mount, Mount Gox went down three years ago. Um, we've had several events in the last few weeks that have stranded tens of millions of dollars of Bitcoin in systems because of uh, hacking or software bugs. But this is not a proven system at all. This is not ready for prime time. And... Whether it was an intended effect, it also conditions people to the concept of digital currency, where yes. you don't require you know hard currency, hard cash anymore, right? And what Bitcoin also needs to do is make it so it's easier to parlay that cryptocurrency into a product or a service or or goods. There has to be more. Out of an outlet for it, right? It just can't keep bouncing around like in, you know, this digital cyberland. But you're not able to transfer that and turn it into food or turn it into fuel or something. So there has to be, you know, inroads in that direction as well. Well, you sort of can. Um, it's certainly possible to do that now. More and more. Are they doing that more and more now? That, more and more. Now, I mean, you actually, there's the ATMs you can go to. You can cash in and out of Bitcoin. We're in a gray area right now. We're actually in this mid-development period, much like we were in technology probably in the late 80s and early 90s before the Internet really kicked in. Um, it was sort of off radar in terms of legislation and control. And then by the mid-90s, certainly by the time of the Clinton administration, when you had all these, the Digital Millennium Act and all of these acts having to do with um, uh, computer law, they began to regulate it. We're in that interim period right now where people are going in and out of the Bitcoin universe. Um, I don't know that a lot of those people are aware that the Internal Revenue Service which isn't just in the United States, by the way, sports fans, it's international. It links to every, every, every nation on, on the planet is, is, is locked into the IRS system. So they have um, basically bots out there that are, are scraping all the data off of the uh, Bitcoin ledgers. And they have algorithms. They have programmers working actively to begin matching up those um, transactions with people on either end of the Bitcoin universe. So very clearly by next year, they're going to begin to formulate le legislation. You're going to begin to see some of these Bitcoin millionaires and billionaires that are going to have huge tax bills as a result of alleged capital gains on their earnings in the Bitcoin universe. That's just one aspect of it. Then the other aspects of it are how are they going to regulate the people that are doing what is essentially securities within the Bitcoin universe because they're going to have to regulate that as well. So the, there's this period where you can move in and out of Bitcoin, not gracefully. If we move into the period where Bitcoin becomes widely accepted, it will also be heavily regulated. Yes, and it's, 
you know, the, the volatility, the fluctuations, it's, it's astounding. I mean, you know, in the old days, when the market would drop X number of points, people would jump out of windows, but then later on, they call that a correction and no big deal. Meanwhile, the, you know, system gets worse and worse. Now, before we reach the end of this fascinating first segment, Randy, you were talking about the petrodollar fiat reserve currency system and what all this warfare and, you know, the threat of war looming or expanded wars actually, how is that going to play out? Because the only way they can keep the way I see it, the only way they can keep the, the petrodollar even relevant is to have an expansion of wars, which will have a knock on effect of, of more quantitative easing, more uh, printing of, of fiat currency, which eventually inevitably may lead to, you know, hyperinflation. So, like, where are we going as far as, and how much longer do you think? I mean, in our field, we hate to make these prognostications. We hate to put a date on things because people later on could point it and said, well, you said this was going to happen by this certain date. Didn't happen, right? But, you know, just thinking out loud, what's going to come in 2018, at least at the surface level? Because we're in, in the second half, folks, we're going to get, I mean, this is just a precursor leading up to part two where we're going to be talking about all kinds of deep black, weird science stuff. So, so stay tuned. 2018. 2018 is probably going to be the reckoning. I don't look, this thing's been, this thing's been running on fumes for a decade or so. You know, the crash 2008, 2009 and everything that went on in the background of all of that, which ruined, you know, many people. I mean, my own parents included, they literally died almost penniless uh, in that period of time. Uh, reckoning is coming and it's going to come one of two ways in my opinion it's going to be a severe crash that's going to drop us into uh, a, a, a collapse we've never seen before or they are going to do a reset what's called a CV uh, an RV a revaluation or them and move us into some sort of digital currency system either way this has been their agenda for a long time to get us to accept digital currency that's why I'm not a raving lunatic Bible thumper. I quoted that verse from the book of Revelation simply to say that's either part of the script that they're running or it was long ago projected that that was a plan they were going to follow through with and they do things in very metaphorical ways. Uh, that's not a prophecy. It may be a script that's been run in the background for, you know, maybe a few thousand years to get us to this place. We see... The, this increase of, of all these false flag shootings and, you know, Las Vegas is just a classic example that the official story has been torn to shreds countless times and witnesses are starting to die that, you know, have seen things that and have stated they've seen things that are completely different from what the official story is, which has been changing itself. So what we're seeing also is that this kind of par running in parallel these efforts at gun control uh, with all these fast uh, false flag shootings and, and, and shooting incidents. And on the other hand, we're seeing the Soros funded Antifa types and, and, and more of a divide and conquer thing going on. And then the backdrop to that is possible war looming expansion of war with Iran and North Korea. So we've got it all going on in, in our little corner of the multiverse, Randy. Yeah, it's cultural dys dysphoria. It's the exact same thing we were talking about with the, with the gender wars. It's designed to get us to a place where we give up trying to guess what we are and we simply capitulate to the collective identity, the hive mind that they have mapped out for the next version of human, human 3.0. Well, we've reached the end of a fascinating first half. Uh, Randy, do you want to tell our listeners uh, how they can get a hold of you and, and uh, your website and, and whatnot? <clears throat> yeah, the website is offplanetradio.com, and that website has um, usually the, I will say, probably nine most current shows on the front page. There's a deeper archive. We are also uh, on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash offplanetmedia, and uh, you can look me up on Facebook, hit me, and um, I interact there as well. Well, we've reached the end of a fascinating first segment. Uh, this is James Bartley with our special guest, Randy Moggins. 
And if you like what we do, if you believe in what we do, please go to the cosmic switchboard.com, sign up and become a member, and we'll see you at the top of the next hour.